About a week ago, I got an ESP8266 to broadcast analog television. This was a lot of fun. If you're curious, you can click on that video now. But if you're not, or you've already seen it, keep watching. Like the video before, I'm outputting the NTSC video broadcast on channel 3 over the RX pin of the ESP8266. That's because the RX pin is wired up to a high-speed I2S bus that I can control at 80 megahertz. One of the other differences with this, though, is that I have had to actually unplug the antenna. So I've, I've actually disconnected the capacitor that links it to the antenna. I have no idea why that took it from barely working at all to working really well with the network, but uh, that was one big difference. One of the other notable differences is that now that I'm able to transmit a much clearer signal, or at least much closer to the carrier, I can now have the transmitter over here and all the way over here is the receiver. This TV is tuned to channel 3, just like it was before, and the signal's a lot clearer. Another cool thing is this big set right here, which has much more stringent timing requirements, is completely happy with this signal. There is a little bit of a difference with this, though. Now, I'm able to encode chroma. So, you may not be able to see it very clearly on this screen, but that's actually color. I'm still able to get the same resolution, sort of, but uh, I ended up having to play some tricks to get it. One of the other things is it does use a little bit more CPU, so I can only display, I don't know, how many is that? It's 20 balls on this screen instead of 25. But now the next screen looks really cool. Now I'm able to put color in anywhere that I was previously only able to have black and white. Color, you ask, but how? Well, color is actually not that hard to encode. The problem is you have to both get the main carrier, which for NTSC channel 3 is 61.25. You also have to encode a chroma signal. Now, it turns out if you just do that, it, the TV receives it. A little bit more complicated to get it to go because you have to have the color burst and other things set up right. But just by encoding both the main signal and at the right times encoding a chroma signal, we can now get glorious color. Look at those colors. Look at them. They're different between this TV and this TV. Why is that? Why is NTSC never the same color? Look at that purple there. Look at that red there. Why? Why? Like before, I'm able to run this website here. It's on the ESP8266. I'm direct connected directly to it as is the default when you first get it. Even though it's outputting this NTSC video, the new ESP-IoT SDK has such better performance, you can see that I can get an upwards of 900 hertz over this WebSockets interface. If you're curious about the WebSockets interface video, you can click right here. At any rate, now I have a new tab, this NTSC tab. It lets me do actually useful things, like setting it to specific screen numbers. So I can arbitrarily just say, you know what, go back to screen zero. or for this video, let's go to screen 11. This is a test screen. This one allows me to try different colors. You can see right here, there's a Fourier analysis of a specific color that I'm going to be playing with. So in this screen right here, there's some code. What this does is it creates two sine waves, one at 61.25 megahertz for the Luma, and the other one at 61.25 megahertz plus the chroma carrier. So right now, this is outputting it some, some Luma and some Chroma, 0.9 and 0.5, and it's outputting this to color number 6. It is the second color on the right from the right, second row down. So third one from the left, it's that blue one right there. It has 0.9, as I said, Luma, and 0.5 Chroma, and a phase offset. I can change that phase offset and in real time, just by changing this code here, it updates the value on the ESP for the Chroma outputs. And that's, that's kind of neat. What's really going on here is this code, this JavaScript, is being executed in a web worker behind the scenes where it's also computing a DFT of the signal. So I can change things here. I can say, let's just get rid of the, the Chroma carrier. Let's make the, the power output very small. So now all of a sudden, because it's very small, it's, it's just bright white. And say that's a gray. And the higher power we make it, the darker it will be. That's just because of how the NTSC works, standard works with broadcast. You can also see here a DFT 
of what the signal looks like. So right now there's just a peak at 61.25 megahertz. But if we increase the chroma like that, now we see another peak out here at 61.25 plus the chroma carrier. That is how we get color. So one of the things that a lot of you might be asking, and I was asking since the previous video, is how does this output something at 64.8 megahertz if its clock is at 80 megahertz? Nyquist states that you cannot do this because it's more than half of the carrier frequency. So if we go back and we take a look at this, 0 to 40, which is the range that we should be able to transmit. Yes, there's interesting things going on all over the place on up to 40. It's because this is outputting a square wave over the I squared S port. But if we go and we look up to 80 megahertz, we're not just getting multiplications of lower waves. We're not getting overtones and things like that. What we're actually getting is the wave is mirroring around half of the carrier. So as you can see, this wave up here at 64 and etc. megahertz, these are mirrors, images, of what is below. That's how the frequencies go that high. If I drop the carrier, let's say we make it, I don't know, 51, now we can see that the carrier moves down here. Or 50, or 48, or 45, or 44, 3, 2, 1, 0. How cool is that, that they're mirror images? So all we really care about is from 60 to 66, because that's where our actual signal is. That's how we get red. One of the other interesting things is you can see a lot of dot crawl on a lot of these, these images here. So the dot crawl, say here, is, is pretty pronounced. And that's because this isn't really producing a very nice wave. This is producing a very, very nasty wave that the TVs happen to be able to interpret as NTSC video in color. Which kind of blows my mind that the TVs are nice enough to accept that, but you know, I'll take it. When you look at this, the signal, you can see that it looks really clean on the screen, but the TV interprets is really dirty. That's because at exactly 1408 bits, the frequencies work out just perfectly as multipliers to make everything work together perfectly. But the TV doesn't take an entire slice of 1408 bits at 80 megahertz. It takes much, much smaller slices. So if we change the window down to 100 here, then we can kind of get a figure for what the TV's really seeing. It's seeing these itty bitties, ups and downs, and changes in frequency, and all of that. So as the TV scans across, you can see that it's getting all those little ups and downs and everything in between. So even though we're sending relatively overall about the right frequency, because we're just trying to dither this one bit DAC, the signal is just so poor that the TVs, well, it's just a dead giveaway when you try to encode the color. One of the things we've really been looking at is this within frequency domain. And that's, that's great for understanding how things are being represented or looking at kind of a, a shot over time. But that's not how we're actually outputting a signal. We can't just output a signal at, say, 40 megahertz, and that's just one signal, and output another one at some other frequency. What we're actually doing is outputting one bit at a time, an analog value that's either 0 or 3.3 volts, and one at a time just outputting it out to the, the, the pin. So let's take a, a closer look at what that would be. First, let's just make this a nice 20 megahertz signal and make it so if it's on the positive end, it's plus, and if it's on the negative end, it's minus, so there's no offset. And let's take a look at this. So in here, we can see that it goes negative 1, negative 1, 1, 1, negative 1, negative 1, 1, 1, negative 1, negative 1, 1, 1, negative 1, negative 1, 1, 1. It's periodic and it's cycling at 20 megahertz. That's because each one of these is 1 80th of a, a 1 80 millionth of a second. And so if you put four of them together, you get 1 20 millionth of a second. Say we don't want to make the signal as strong. Right now it's relatively strong. What we can do is demand that it's above some other value, like 0.6. And so this will now decrease the amount that the signal is on. Let's take a look at one of them. 
So now we can see that it's negative 1, negative 1, negative 1, 1. Negative 1, negative 1, negative 1, 1. Negative 1, negative 1, negative 1, 1. And what this does is it makes it so that the signal is less strong. What we can also do to look at this is say change the frequency to something that doesn't divide evenly. Let's make it 30 megahertz. So now, instead of it being something that's a really nice pattern like negative 1, negative 1, 1, 1, now we get negative 1, 1, 1, negative 1, 1, negative 1, negative 1, 1, negative 1, 1, 1, negative 1, 1, negative 1, negative 1. And so what you're getting is something where the actual frequency is, is being stippled out. So this, even though it's not a nice repeating pattern, really convenient, it's still, I guess, nicer than something else it could be, but it's actually kind of averaging between the samples what frequency is being output. So we can see this, this graph here, and this is in absolute power, it's not in dB. We can check this little box here, and now it's in dB. I, I personally don't really like the dB scale, but whatever, I'll just accept it. At any rate, point is, you can see that there's actually a lot of nodes all over the place. So let's take a look at this here. This is a, uh, a frequency spectrum analyzer, and it's actually one of the coolest ones I've ever used. You might ask, well, why is it so cool? The reason it's so cool is because it was like $10. This cute little SDR here, look at that thing. It's just a, just a funky little white box you plug into your laptop is $10 and it gives you this amazing signal. So, at any rate, right now I'm centered on 61.3 well, megahertz and you can see that that's where there's a lot of signal. So we can also bump it up some, say here we're seeing another lobe at 63.5 something, but there's really not very much chroma in that area there. That's because there's a lot of stuff going on that's not really that bright in the chroma spectrum on the TV. But what I can do is I can jam a certain color. So right now I'm going to jam color 6. TV doesn't know what to make of that because it's just this, well, it's just nothing to it. It's just this repeating pattern. But the SDR knows. So now I'm transmitting some at 61.5 and some at 64.8, but I'm transmitting this signal continuously. So now we can go over here and we can see, yep, there's still a signal right here at 61.25. And there's actually some side lobes. It's kind of neat. You can see them. So there's this one here and that little lobe there and a little lobe there. You see a little lobe there and a little lobe there. Let's bump it up some. And there's also this, what was that? Uh, whatever. There's also the signal right here, which is the chroma signal at 64 megahertz. And you can see that one matches right there, along with this other little lobe right there. So these signals that we're outputting, even though they're just a bitstream of ones and zeros, the effect that we're having in real life by looking at this sp the spectrum analyzer is exactly the same as we would predict based on the FFT of the signal. When I say FFT, I really mean DFT, but same deal. And that's kind of how all of this works. So if you have any other questions or anything, please uh, comment below, and I'll try to get around to answering all the questions. I hope you guys enjoyed this, this follow-up video. Thanks. One thing I forgot to mention was that all of this code is available on GitHub, along with a fairly comprehensive readme file. So if you're curious and want to check it out, please uh, just go over and check out the GitHub link available in the description. So you can see a lot... Well... <laughs> uh... Uh...